Judges chapter 6. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, and I probably butchered that name, but close. He said, in matters of faith, every generation has to begin again. And that's what we see over and over in this cycle in the Judges is this beginning again. And we just got, we just got done in um, chapter 5 of Deborah's song and uh, the nation celebrating of this great victory and, and this um, overcoming the oppression that God had done a great work working through uh, Deborah and Barak and uh, the nation celebrated and they had peace in the land, had rest in the land for, for 40 years and then, then chapter 6 begins, then they forgot the words of the song. They forgot the, the, the song of thankfulness. They forgot their past, both their sins, but also where God has moved in their past. They, they forgot what God had done. So then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of, the Midian, hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made for themselves dens, the caves and the strongholds which are in the mountains. And so it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also, Amalekites and the people of the east would come against them. And then they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth and as, as far as Gaza and leave no substance uh, for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, uh, both they and their camels uh, were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. And so Israel was greatly impoverished because the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out, to the Lord. And so the stage is set for the next, um, really the beginning of the next cycle. It's the same cycle, it's the same sort of bullet points of the cycle, but the, we get a little bit different, we get different names, we get different uh, form that the apostasy takes, and um, we get something a little bit different in this cycle. Actually, we get several things that are slightly different. Um, but it, But Israel once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord and for seven years we don't know how or when Gideon was raised up we're going to read about the Lord beginning to do a work against the Midianites but he raised up the Midianites turned them over to once again suffer under their hand and so for seven years uh, it, it appears that they lived uh, at least in caves in some form or fashion hidden away can you imagine in in the harvest season of of seeing the fields ready for harvest and and then all of a sudden uh, an invasion comes in like a swarm of locusts and just strips the land and takes all the livestock takes all the produce and leaves you nothing and so it just talks about the the children of israel being impoverished which is a word that means they they were just left to languish left to starve they didn't come in and slaughter them all they didn't they didn't have any political sort of uh, uh, process or anything that they were after. They just wanted to suffer, wanted them to suffer and to hold them in, uh, to hold them uh, in power, be in power over them. And so they were kept them impoverished. And, and this is what the hand of the Lord used in the Midianites is sort of his scourge this time. And, and uh, they, they felt the pain to the point where they began to cry out to the Lord. Verse 7, and it came to pass uh, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord against the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you out of e uh, up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before you, 
and gave you their land. And also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And this, this is a, sort of a new part of this cycle of the judges as we started the cycle and every cycle we seem to sink to a new low and and we do actually see a hints of a new low in this and in this case that the lord didn't just hear their cry and respond with a judge but that he responded through a prophet and basically rebuking them uh, for what they had done that that the lord had brought them that he delivered them from egypt and he had done a great work and they had forgotten they had forgotten all that the lord had done in the past and they were chasing other gods that they had uh, once again apostasy just was rampant in the nation and, and again we get we get to see that as we go on he said i brought you up i delivered you i drove them out i gave you the land and i told you don't fear their gods you know and, and there's two ways of looking at that one they were not supposed to have any respect for those gods of, of all the neighbors of all the amorites they weren't supposed to have any respect for them, but in the same sense, they weren't supposed to have any sort of a fear, whether it be military fear or anything else. They weren't supposed to fear them in that sense either. They had not obeyed the voice of the Lord. And really what it comes down to is the fear of men was greater than the fear of God. The fear of what men would think what this foreign government would think what the military leaders would think um, and, and all of that had more authority over their life and, and guided their life more than what the Lord had told them man that should speak to every one of us we're coming to a point where we have important choices to make and, and we have to be um, cognizant of some of our choices as we choose to walk with the Lord may cause pain in our life and 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 so be it. We are supposed to be obedient to the Lord. We are supposed to obey his voice, obey his word. And we have his word. And, and not picking it up and not studying it is no excuse. We've, we've been given this and that we should know it. We should know what is the Lord expects of us and how to live in his light and his love. And let, let, uh, let him take care of all those other things. And, and so this is... Uh, this is what we see in this, this apostasy that form it took in the nation there what was that they, they had forgotten their past. They'd forgotten what God had done. They had forgotten what um, the promises that the Lord would always be with them. And they had no reason to fear these things. And they came to know this fear, fearing the other gods and worshiping them and fearing the other gods and uh, being held in oppression and being held in... Um, to where they felt like they had to chase after these gods because um, they didn't want to be sideways with those that had power over them, which became their own leaders in the sense. And their own leaders had turned to apostasy. You see this more as we go. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and he sat under the terebinth tree which was in uh, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, uh, the Abiezrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. I'm going to stop there for a moment. The angel of the Lord is uh, a, a great topic of, of study and a great great one to look at and some people automatically say this is a theophany this is an old testament appearance of jesus christ we say this is a messenger of yahweh is really what the text says it's a messenger of yahweh and and so a messenger of yahweh is treated as if it were as if he were yahweh and so there is this reverence as if they were talking to god if we say who is the messenger of the lord in the flesh we automatically want to call him Jesus and so I think we can um, you can find study Bibles that go all over the place on this and, uh, and and we can say that this is Yahweh in the flesh and whatever um, and that's what the scripture would tell us right this is a Yahweh in the flesh a messenger bringing his word 
And so this angel of the Lord, and, and we're going to watch this as we go too. This angel of the Lord came and it sat under the terebinth tree. The terebinth tree, trees were all uh, marked all through Scripture. You know, they were, they were like symbols. They were markers of something great happened at this tree, that there was a meeting at this tree. There was knowledge given at this tree that somebody praised, worshipped at this tree. Something amazing happened. It was in a terebinth tree, I think, of Moriah that Abraham uh, met the, uh, the angel of the Lord that told him, you're going to have a son. And uh, that was also at a mark by a tree. And so you can see this all through Scripture, uh, that trees become these markers. And so this marker is, a, is this terebinth tree, which is kind of like an oak tree, I think, um, at, at this city called Ophir. Now, Ophir, nobody's really quite sure. Uh, there's just really speculation of where that is. It's in that sort of Jezreel Valley sort of area, very similar to where we talk about with uh, Barak and Deborah. It's in that same sort of the general area. Um, and so this, this tree, this area, this sort of farm belonged to Joash, which is Gideon's father. Uh, Joash has an interesting name because his name means Yahweh is strong. And uh, just kind of interesting, we'll talk about it a little bit more as we go. Yahweh is strong, his name means. And uh, his son is, is threshing wheat in the wine press uh, because he's hiding from the Midianites. So it's fascinating. Set the picture, God is, the God is sitting under an oak tree. Uh, Gideon is threshing wheat in the wine press. Now, normally threshing wheat would have, been, would, would have been done on a threshing floor, which is a big sort of elevated open place, and they would thresh their wheat. It really it was a community gathering together at the threshing floor. And a harvest was happening, and the, everybody came out together, and so... It was a time of celebration and thankfulness to God and, and all of this, but they couldn't do that because the Midianites might see them. So instead, they went down to this wine press, which would have been probably at that time maybe a, a sort of a rock that was bowl-shaped in some fashion. They would press grapes. They, they decided to thresh wheat in that area, you know, all the time on the lookout for the Midianites that they would catch them. And so they're getting his threshing wheat and hiding for his father, whose name is Yahweh is strong. And uh, it sets the, um, the picture, verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared, which kind of implies that the angel of the Lord was under the terebinth tree, had not yet appeared. But the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor, which kind of. I find rather comical. There's the mighty man of valor is hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat on the lookout for the Midianites. And uh, the Lord is sitting under the tree saying, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. And he meant it. And, and it was something that Gideon needed to hear, be reminded of, and he will continue to be reminded of that, need to be reminded of that. Uh, Gideon said to him, O oh Lord, and, and he's using the term Adonai here. He's not, he doesn't know this is the angel of the Lord. He doesn't recognize this, uh, this messenger as, as Yahweh in any form or fashion. He is just recognizing as this person. He probably calls him Lord because he recognizes maybe as a prophet of some sort. And so he, he acknowledges sort of a, this person is a person of authority, uh, someone that he would look up to. And so Gideon says, oh, my Lord, uh, uh, if the Lord, in he, this time he says Yahweh, if Yahweh is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? And, and why are, are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But how did the, how did the Lord, ha but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And Gideon is, is saying um, to this what he presumed probably to be a prophet. I know, I know the Lord is with us, you know, is sort of the way it comes across. But, but where is he at? Why is this happening to us? I mean, everywhere we look, they're, they're coming in and stealing our crops. And, and they're, they're harming the, 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 the community. 
and people are starving and and that everywhere we look they're having their way with us we don't see you God where are you God Gideon doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't even acknowledge that God played no part in his life. This is a frustrating thing to see play out, particularly in, in, in folks that call themselves Christians. It's a frustrating thing to see when the bottom drops out the life and they say, where are you, God? Why are you allowing this to happen? But the fact that you don't know is because you don't read your scriptures. And it's not to be cruel or not to be to be real. God never promised you easy street when you got saved. And that promise certainly was never given to Gideon. He was a mighty man of valor. If you are a follower of God, stand up and be a man of God. But what if they see me? Really? Stand up for your faith. Stand up for it. It's important. It's sickening to see us people of faith fold up. <clears throat> when I get fired up, my voice goes high. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I need a little more teed up in here. <clears throat> I've completely lost my place. Um, where's all the miracles of Gideon? Our fathers told us about this. We, we've heard the stories when we grew up about God did miracles and he worked through people and worked through prophets. Where's his miracles at? Gideon says, and this is really fascinating because then you go to verse 14. Gideon says, the Lord has forsaken us and he's sitting right in front of me. Man, oh man, that's convicting, isn't it? We complain that the Lord has forsaken us and, and, and the enemy has taken our nation and darkness is everywhere. But not only is the Lord in our midst when we gather together, but the Holy Spirit lives in us. My goodness. Verse 14 then. The Lord didn't say, well, Gideon, let me answer all your questions about miracles and about why you think God's forsaken you. He doesn't answer any of that. The Lord turned. He didn't say the angel turns here, does it? It says, Yahweh turned. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? It's almost like the Lord is saying, You got a good point. Get in. Let's do something. Let's do something. Get up, man. Go. Go in this might of yours. You sound fired up, and you want to see a miracle, and you want to see God move. Let's go. Let's do it. And Gideon says, Oh Lord, um, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and, and I am the least in my father's house. So you, you see this sort of Moses response, don't you? I, I don't know how to do anything. It's a sad excuse of Christianity. I believe God should do mighty things. Just don't ask me to step out and do any of it. Just don't inconvenience me. Don't ask me to risk anything for crying out loud, God. I really want to see a move of God, but I didn't, really want, I didn't want to risk anything in my life. I didn't want to risk my person, personal, myself in my life. don't want to be uncomfortable. Gideon saying, I, how can I save Israel? I'm, I'm weak. He said, I'm from the, um, the weakest clan. It's the, 
a clan that had no authority. He said, I, I myself personally, he said, I, I wouldn't have any authority even over my own clan. I could even go to my own family and say, hey, come on, guys, follow me. And they were just like, Pfft. He's like, he's like, you know, and I sort of picture Gideon as some like 90 pound weekly and uh, his little pipsqueak and God's building him up in faith. That God is showing him what is available, that, I, that God is with you and that God can use you and God doesn't measure by the size of the man or his intellect or, or the tribe he's from or anything else. He says, stand up, be a man, let's go. Walk in faith. When God says, let's go, we got to go. So Gideon is like, he's got to rock back on his heels. Like, I, that's not really what I was thinking about. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, verse 16, the Lord again said to him, not, it doesn't say the angel of the Lord, which I love this. And certainly I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. That part would scare me. It's one, one man. But surely I will be with you. This is, to me, this is the most important line of the entire lesson, of the entire chapter. And the Lord just says, surely I will be with you. What more do you need? Well, we need some tanks. And, and I need to see how this is all going to play out. And I see, you know, he moves there and how I can stay safe and comfortable. I mean, this is the way we think, right? When in fact God said, I'm going to be with you. Go. And I'll lead you and I will guide you. And you have the God, the Holy Spirit, living inside of you as being in Christ. And, and do we have a right to ask for anything more? God is in us, and he says, I will leave you and never forsake you. We have this promise. And yet we want more. We want understanding. We want details. We want facts. We want to see the outcome. We want to... You know, we, our idea of faith is being able to see all of the steps all along the way before we actually take one of those steps. Verse 17, then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, you show me a sign that it is you who talk to me. Do not depart from here or pray until I come to you and bring uh, out um, bring out my offering and set it before you. Honestly, I'm not sure who he thought you was. I'm not sure who he thought he was talking to. I mean, I think he was in his mind this was a prophet of God. And I'm not sure he he was thinking of Yahweh at this point. That sounds harsh, but they got an altar to Baal in their backyard. They got a sheriff pool in their backyard. All the community comes to Joash's place of worship to worship these other gods. So when Gideon is talking to this prophet, is he a prophet of who? And when he says, I have found, if I have found favor in your sight, then, then show me a sign that it is you. I'm not sure what you he's talking about yet because I don't think he understands this is the messenger of Yahweh. Who is he thinking of? And it's really telling, isn't it, that maybe we even have to ask that question. It's really telling of what was going on, the apostasy that was so present in their, in their community and in their nation that when they talked about God, they weren't even exactly sure. Now, what God is it you're talking about? And we've come to the, come to the same thing all, all around us. Because people talk about Jesus, but they don't know the Jesus of the Bible. Everybody believes in God in some form or fashion, it seems like. But it's very superficial, and there's nothing behind most of that belief. It seems to have been that way for some time. The angel of God and the angel of the Lord said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon, verse 19, he, he went in and he prepared a young goat and unleavened bread and, and uh, from an ephah flour he 
uh, the meat he put in the basket, and he put the broth in the pot, and he brought them out to the angel of the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour broth on them. And he did so. This is quite a meal for an impoverished family. In this time of, of a nation being impoverished from the Midianites raiding ev- all of their produce and all of their animals every time they turn around, this is quite a meal that he's prepared and so he, he is, is showing respect, but the fact is that this is not a, a um, sacrifice offering. This is um, either a uh, hospitality, a meal of hospitality, or, or a, um, uh, a meal as a thank offering, and, which was a common thing to these other gods that would have been in the area. And so we don't know. We don't know again. We're not sure what Gideon had in mind. But he brings this meal out, and, and the Lord um, waits for this meal. And the Lord knows what's on his heart. The Lord knows his intention, and the Lord knows where this is going, right? Verse 21, Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread, and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed from his sight. (coughs) And so, fire rises out of rock, consumes uh, uh, consumes this meal that he brought before him. And um, what a sight that must have been. And I can imagine Gideon, like, um, suddenly having... A moment where he had a new understanding as this happened and at the same time the angel of the Lord departed from his sight where did he go the angel of the Lord left verse 22 but Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord he finally arrived there that this is the messenger of Yahweh He's kind of fascinating because he knows that in his heart of hearts, only God, only the true God could do that. Only the true God can do those things. And so it it almost reveals um, this truth existed in his life and all this other junk, this apostasy that they were in, uh, just had no real depth to it, no value to them. Gideon perceived that it was the angel of the Lord. And so Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. So suddenly this this outcry that he's seen God face to face is is a fear that they understood that if you see God face to face, you're going to die. That was just, you would not survive it. And so this is that fear being vocalized that he's saying, I've seen the angel of the Lord. and, And he just didn't imagine that he would survive. Verse 23, then the Lord said to him, "Uh, Peace be with you, Uh, do not fear, and you shall not die. It's kind of fascinating because it said the Lord was now not visible. He's gone. But the conversation continues. That's very cool. The Lord said to him, Peace be with you, do not fear, you shall not die. Verse 24, so Gideon built an altar there, to the Lord, and he called it the Lord is peace. And and to this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abizrites. So this is why the tree is famous, right? This is why the terebinth tree of Ophrah was famous because Gideon met the Lord there, and he made an altar there at that tree to the Lord and, and declared that Yahweh is shalom, Yahweh is peace. Verse 25, now it came to pass the same night uh, that the Lord said to him, take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has and cut down the wooden image that is beside it and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. Take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which he shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men 
uh, from among the servants, and he did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city uh, too much to do so by day, he did, he did it by night. So we still see the fear and, the, and sort of this timidness, but we also see obedience. And God doesn't rebuke him for doing it at night, right? God doesn't say, well, you big chicken. <laughs> he's, he's saying, he's being faithful. He's doing what God told him to do. And, uh, and so he takes this bull, takes his father's bull, now a bull of seven years. You didn't, they didn't keep many bulls. Uh, the bulls died young. They only kept a bull that had the, 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 had the greatest of the flock that would perpetuate the flock, right? And so they only kept uh, certain bulls. And so this was obviously one of great value that had been kept this long. And so he says, take this bull. And so there's some, in, some study Bibles that say there's probably two bulls. They read that as two bulls. Most of them, I think, uh, display it as a single bull. It doesn't really change what we're studying uh, change the way we're looking at it, but some speculate that one bull will help pull down the altar while the other bull was sacrificed. But here's the picture, right? Uh, this is the first test. So where does where does the the first work of cleaning things up happens right in your own backyard? <laughs> Gideon was being called by God to be obedient and to say, "Listen, that I will never leave you, forsake you, and that you are not to fear these other gods." And by the way, you have an altar to Baal. And an Ashtoreth pole in your backyard for crying in a bucket. That's got to go first. Starts right in your own house. So this is sort of the answer to your question. Like, where is God? Why don't I ever see God moving? Why, why is this happening in my life? And, and God never gives him an answer. But he says, let's start with tearing down the altar in your own backyard. Remember his dad's father, his, his father's name was Joe Ash that meant Yahweh is strong. His name means Yahweh is strong and he has an altar in his backyard. So the Lord says, go and do this. And so he's to take this bull with him. He goes to the altar and he, the altar of Baal, they're not exactly sure, took many different forms. There's different indications, but it was probably a set of stones stacked up in some way to form an altar. Most of the time there was a big sort of a base stone and so whatever this altar was, it was to be toppled down. And, and then the Asherah pole, which was uh, Ashtoreth, the worship, sort of how they worship Ashtoreth. There's some indication that those were, were uh, sort of uh, sexual in nature, phallic symbols. But, but, there's no, but it, it could have been other things. Um, but, but it was what we might call and maybe think of as sort of a totem pole, some sort of image that they worshipped. And... and and in Canaanite, you see this, we talked about this before, you see Baal and Ashtoreth sort of worship together. Baal was the storm god. He was this uh, god over your crops that would bring rain is the way they viewed it. And Ashtoreth was sort of the goddess of fertility that would uh, sort of make your animals fertile. And, and so there was this idea that the, the two of them together, and they got creative with sexual ways of worshiping and and all of this, and it was just very, it just shows a picture of the depth of the apostasy in the land. And this is why God is saying this has got to go. So he, so he topples the uh, altar to Baal, he cuts down the wooden pole, takes the wooden pole down, cuts it up, builds a fire on the altar, so this, imagine this stone altar of Baal, builds a fire on it with the wood of this of this uh, goddess, and it sets it on fire, slaughters this bull, and is doing a whole burnt offering right on the fire. Right there's the picture. So that offering, what a bull would have taken hours to burn. That would have taken a long time. Would have burned for a long time. And so this is what he does in the middle of the night. He had a little. He had a bonfire. Ten him and ten guys. And. Uh, I'm not sure how he thought doing that at night. Maybe he just didn't get caught doing it, but they were going to know pretty quickly. Verse 28. When the men of the city arose uh, early in the morning, and there was the altar of Baal torn down. Now, this is fascinating because the men of, of the city arose early in the morning, and, and it's as if the first thing they did is went to this altar. 
I mean, this is the time when they should be making their sacrifices, that there should be a, a sacrifice at the tabernacle, that even though they couldn't be there, they would acknowledge it in their prayer, and it was their prayer time and their time of worship to Yahweh. But they had formed this habit of, of going out to this altar of Baal in some way, and so the men of the city rose early, and they immediately knew that there was a problem, that the altar had been torn down, and so apparently all of the men of the city were coming to Joash's property to his altar and worshiping there. And so they found it tore down and the wooden image that was beside it was cut down and the, the second bull was being offered on the, uh, on the altar which had been built. So they, they, get it, they understand what they're seeing, that the altar's been destroyed, that the other one is burning, it is becoming the fires that are burning the burnt offering to the Lord. That God took the uh, pagan altar and he had this man build an altar to God on top of it using the same materials. So, and so they uh, said to one another, who has done this thing? This is the first thing on their mind. Who has done this? Somebody's got to pay. Who would do such a thing? This is kind of fascinating because if you look like, in, in, in go read Deuteronomy 13 later. Deuteronomy 13 said, if, some, if a prophet rises amongst you and he wants to lead you to another God, that you are to investigate this other God that he would lead you to and you take him out. If he is leading you to some other God besides Yahweh, if he is bringing something else into the camp, you take him out and you stone him. And you get rid of him, Right? And it's fascinating because they want to find out who knocked down their altar of Baal and they're ready to take him out and kill him. But it doesn't bother them a bit that they have completely turned away from God. And this is just, this is just bizarre. And, it, and really, it's sort of, to me, it's sort of a picture of how the human mind works out. We can just justify anything and we can twist things around and justify anything, and, which is why we need God's word. It's why we need community, why we need to be together and hold each other accountable. And I think it's so important. When they inquired and asked, and, and they said Gideon, the son of Joash, had uh, done this. Now I'm thinking, if Gideon was hidden before, he's in the deepest, darkest cave right now. Right? And God's going, get out of the cave. Come on, stand up, man. Men of the city said to Joash, bring your son out that he may die. Bring your son out that he may die. And he has tore down the altar of Baal. Because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash uh, said to all who stood against him. I can just imagine Joash looking at these guys and thinking for a moment. This altar was in his backyard. It was, he was all in with it. He would have been worshiping if everything was fine. He would have been worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth with these other men. But he's found a moment of clarity now because his son's life's on the line. Things have changed. He says, would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Or let the one who would plead for him uh, to put be put to death by morning, which is, is sort of saying, if you... If you want to plead for Baal, Baal and go kill my son, you're going to die by morning. This was a threat. That, that, uh, and he's making an argument. If Baal is God, Baal should fight for Baal. Baal should fight for Baal that you should not have to defend your God. So let your God defend himself because if you choose to go defend God, I'm going to defend and bring retribution against my son. And you're going to die by morning. And they went, huh, maybe you got a point. <laughs> Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If, if he is a God, let him plead for himself. Because his altar was torn down. Verse 32. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jeroboam saying, let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. 
And I was just like, Gideon comes back, and he's like, you got a new name. It's, it's, it's Jerubbaal. And um, he would have known what that meant. The name means Baal's going to deal with you. That had to make Gideon a little bit nervous. But God says, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. And you're not to fear these other gods. Now he's got a name that says, this other god's going to get you. And God says, that god ain't going to get you until I say you're going to get God. It's as simple as that. Nothing can happen to you until I say something can happen to you. And so every day that Gideon lives is a, is, is a, a testimony to the weakness of Baal. Every day that Gideon breathes and moves, all those that would worship Baal say, he never did anything about it. I don't think he can. I'm not sure he has power. God is showing himself mighty, and, and, and it's as if God is just exposing the weakness of Baal and showing them their own apostasy, chasing after this powerless God. And their God was with them and loved them and always wanted them to have a relationship with him and him alone. Then all the Midianites, verse 33, the Malachites and the people of the east, which I think is fascinating. It started with the Midianites. And, and it's just like when you see a weakness of a nation like that, it's just like it's just like everybody comes out of the woodwork to pile on. And so you see the Midianites have their way, and so suddenly the Malachites jump on board, and they have their way with them too. And then some cats from the east jump in and say, hey, we'll take some of that too, and we'll jump in on that and, and beat on them a while. And so these all joined together, Midianites and Malachites, the people of the east, they gathered together, and they crossed over and they camped to the Valley of Jezreel. This is the Valley of Jezreel where we just had seen a previous battle. And, and it was a, a, around this exact same area at that river where, where God delivered um, uh, Sisera into the hands of Barak and his army and set Sisera on the run. And, uh, and so we saw that that battle there. This is a pl place of many battles, this, this uh, location. And the battles are going to go on forever because there's another name for this place in this section. This place is, is called Megiddo and uh, is often referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. And so all they then come to this place at this valley of Jezreel, um, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. And I can imagine when Gideon looked in the distance, this valley is very flat, he sees these nations coming. And before they had noted they, that they were like, the, like a swarm of locusts coming. They were numerous, and all their animals and all the people, they were numerous beyond anything they could see. And, and it was like, you, you ever seen a swarm of locusts go through? You can't, you can't see through it. It's just like a dark cloud. And when they're done, everything is gone. Everything is dead. Everything is brown when they leave. I can imagine Gideon has a big lump in his throat right now. He sees this and he's thinking, oh, Lord, what have I done now? Lord, you better be with me. And the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon. And everything changes. Every one of these stories fascinates me because you go, all these people, thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and they're all in their separate communities, all cowered down, hiding in caves from these people, and going, I hope they raid the neighboring town and not us, and they, we get by this time, and we get to keep our food. And they don't even look at their own neighbors and care about the other parts of their community. <coughs> and so the, the nation was all divided, all splintered, and but there were thousands of them, if they'd just taken a stand, but there was, there was no leadership. There was no, uh, no one had their eyes on the Lord, and so there was no sort of that common thing. What was the common thing for all the people? What was the common thing for all the people 
in this nation from the beginning. It was the Lord. It was the Lord. It, it always has been. Even uh, there was different denominations, and even the denominations early on, sort of, sort of the 13 colonies were sort of colonized because they were different, different denominations, different sort of backgrounds of worship and ways of worship, and a little bit different beliefs. They had a common thing. They worshiped God. And so this was a common thing that we all gathered under the Lord our God. What is common now? What is common around the people of this nation? Facebook? Twitter? I mean, it's sad. They had nothing common in their nation either. The only thing common was they had a, na a, 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 a nation, a group of nations that were going to oppress them. And now that they were getting ready to fight back, they gathered against them and um, to end it, to begin to slaughter. But what was the difference? The Spirit of the Lord came on one man. Man, one man. The Spirit of the Lord comes on him. And he picks up a trumpet, he blows the trumpet. And the Abiezrites gathered behind him, which would have been his own family. And I, I imagine Gideon was probably a little bit like, they are going to follow me, and all his own family files in behind him. And it probably started with those ten men that were along. When he tore down that, and they saw this is the leader, this is what we were after. For somebody to point to God, and somebody was strong, would take a stand and suddenly his family is all behind him, the rest of his, his family. And then his tribe jumps in, which is uh, Manasseh, said, uh, at verse 35, and they sent messengers throughout all of Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. And he also sent messengers to, <clears throat> messengers to Asher, Zebulon, and Naphtali, and they come up to meet him. Now, I think with the arrival of every Next group of people is thousands more. That lump in his throat got bigger. And, and uh, Gideon is thinking, oh my, this is getting big. You know the enemy is going, man, you can't lead these people. You don't have, a, you're not qualified to do this. You can't. And the Lord is saying, stand up. You're my man. And the enemy is trying to beat him down and make him doubt. Man, that war goes on. I, I, everybody knows that war, right? Everybody knows that battle. And uh, that battle rages up here many times, you know, and, and doing worship and stuff. That battle raging when you're studying and um, everybody knows that battle. Um, and you recognize it for what it is and you, you stand strong and you stand through it. And, you, and you, at times you find yourself and you've messed up and you've listened to the enemy and you listen to those words that would break you down and bring fear and cowering. I can't imagine he's standing with all his brothers and sisters, how many people were there at the time. Verse 36 of Gideon said uh, to God, if you will save. So he's still got that if idea. He's still got an if mentality of like, God, if you will save us. Because it's not a foregone conclusion to him yet, right? If you will save Israel by my hand, as you've said. Look, I, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. And if there's dew on the fleece only and is dry on the ground, then um, I shall know that you have saved Israel by my hand, as you have said. Verse 38, and it was so. When he rose early in the morning, the next morning he squeezed the fleece together. He wrung out dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Verse 39, and Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me, but let me speak just, just once more. Let me test, I pray. Just, just once more with this fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground, and let there be dew. And God did so that night, and it was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. And God did not rebuke him for testing him and putting out a fleece. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And so the stage is set. Gideon is he's got all of these people that have come from all these different tribes that have joined him. 
and, and, and this is a posture of war. And on the other side of the Midianites, the, the uh, Amalekites and these goobers from the east that have all gathered together in a posture of war. And so suddenly we have these two armies facing off. Gideon, Gideon's like, just a minute, I'll be right back. And he goes, and, and uh, it has to just check in with the Lord. And, and really what you see is that it's, God doesn't see fault in that. But we have to be cautious. That is not permission for us to be disobedient and to constantly test the Lord. Um, so is setting out a fleece okay? Uh, let me say this. And this is, um, we have three things that Gideon did not have that I think changes the way we would look at this fleece. We have three things he did not have. We have the word of of God as our Savior, we have Jesus Christ. He has already overcome our greatest enemy. Victory has already been won. We can walk victorious in any circumstance that we face because we know the end of our story. And so everything between sort of now and when the end of our story arrives, we can walk in faith knowing that I am safe until the day the Lord's going to take me home. I don't have to live in fear, whether it's the Malachites, Midianites, or the goobers from the east. If you don't know, listen, this is, this is probably one of the most important things of the whole message. If you don't know this adventure, then it is an adventure walking in the Lord. And you can't, you can't, you know, we have a room full of people, we're all brothers and sisters in a church, but we can't can't always just assume that the people that are here that everybody is soundly saved in the Lord and, and I would be failing terribly if I presumed that I said don't play the part if that's you and you don't know that adventure that might be an indication there's a problem it's not shame it's not to shame you it's just asking you to check yourself check your relationship with the Lord there's no shame in this but it is so important radically important, particularly in the days in which we live. Today could be the day of your salvation. The day when you come to know Christ in a new way. And it's simply of, of turning away. And he just said it starts right in your backyard of going, hey, I got some things in my life that need to go. I have no right to go to God and say, God, why is this going on in my life? Why have, have I suffered so? Why am I going through these things? When your own backyard it's got things that have distanced you from the Lord. Start your own backyard. And so this could look like two different things in my mind. One is that salvation never really happened in your life. In which case it is a matter of repenting, turning away from that life, that old life, turning towards Christ, recognizing that He has died on the cross for your sins. And that He loves you. And He went to great lengths to bring that word to you. And he wants to forgive you of your sins today. And the other thing is that those that are saved that aren't walking with him are missing out something terrible. They're missing out on a great blessing and a great adventure of walking in the Lord. But it sounds dangerous. It sounds exciting. And when we are weak, when we recognize our weakness, God shows himself mighty. And so that's the first thing is we... We have a Savior. We have salvation. We have Jesus Christ. The second thing is that we have um, the person of God within us. We have the Holy Spirit. Gideon was suddenly the whole dynamic of the situation changed because the Holy Spirit came on Gideon. He picks the trumpet up and blows it. And man, it, everything changed. The na this is the nation saying to those, we ain't hiding in caves no more. We're done with that. We're taking a stand. Today's the day. And they took a stand. And, and uh, we're going to leave that hanging for a week, right? We'll get back to that. <laughs> we have the Holy Spirit in us. And he guides us and corrects us and he rebukes us. And, and he encourages us. And he becomes that sort of personal messenger of the Lord God. 
that we have access to that messenger of God and he's right in us. That's a promise of the scriptures. And so if you, if you have not heard from the Holy Spirit and you, and you don't understand that and you've not, again, uh, you don't understand hearing from him and, and feeling his presence and his rebuke or his encouragement and his love for you through the Holy Spirit, today's a day when that can change. And again, I would encourage you, the very first thing is to look in your own backyard. Look in your life, look in your home, look at what you allow, shut the TV off, pick the Bible up, whatever that may look like. But you know what it is, most likely, because the Holy Spirit, if you're saved in Christ, He doesn't let you just ignore that without bringing some, some of that in your face. We just become very good at ignoring that. Turn to the Lord. Be fully committed to Him. He said He would be with you. What more do you need for this life? He said He would walk with you and never leave you and never forsake you. What more do you need in this day? Finally, the third thing we have is we have the Word of God in the Bible. And so we have the Word of God in our salvation in Jesus Christ. We have the Word of God living with us in the Holy Spirit. And we have the Word of God as we hold His Scriptures, His message to us. And so we have, we have so many promises, so much that has been said to us, that we have no right to test God when He's already given us the answer. And so now, if you're in a situation where God is asking you to go out and take a stand against an army, then okay, maybe you're okay putting the police out. That's between you and God. But we can't live testing God every day. Because we mess it up. We, we, if we, we corrupt that whole process. Because we're like, God, I know you want me to buy this car because it would make me really happy. So you want me to get the red one or the green one? That's the kind of junk we would bring into it because we would corrupt this. We can't do that. God's Word is so important in our lives. And, and, and if it's not a big part of your life, maybe that's what the Holy Spirit would say to you today. Spend some more time in God's presence in His Word and see what He does with it. See if He doesn't bless you. See if He doesn't just change your life in a radical way. I think for uh, 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 just to end this, and it's time to. The lessons of Gideon were important for Israel to learn. Because we see forgetting the thankfulness, forgetting what God had done. And we see this remembrance coming in, and the Lord building them up one more time and saving them. But too many times our. Our idea of crying out to God is, God, I don't like the circumstances I'm in. I'm in. Not crying out to God, saying, God, I've messed up and I left you. And I forgot you, God, and I've run to other gods, and I'm sorry. That's what repentance looks like, and that's what should be playing out here. Gideon's lessons are the lessons Israel needs. Gideon's lessons are the lessons that that, that we need. And Gideon's questions, God answered all his questions in a roundabout way. Gideon's questions and our questions, God really care about us? Does God care about me personally? Does God take care of me? Does God keep his promises? God said, I'll never leave you. What more do you want? I'll read this and I'll end with this. This is from a commentary by uh, Dale Davis. But I will be with you. Basically, God has nothing else or more to offer you. You can go through a lot with that promise. It does not answer your questions about details. It only provides the essentials. Nothing about when or how or where or why, only the what, or better, the who. But I will be with you, and that is enough.